Well, good afternoon and welcome back. I'm Julie Menon. I'm on the board of the Municipal Arts Society and I chair Community Board One in Lower Manhattan and host a show on NBC. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you this afternoon to our panel on new media and civic engagement. Before I introduce our terrific panel who we have here today, I just wanted to spend a couple minutes making a few introductory comments to set the stage, so to speak, for what our topic is today. With the rise of internet and digital devices, information and services can literally be accessed almost anywhere in New York City and almost by any means. So today, for example, if someone wants to learn about a new neighborhood or they want to find a restaurant or they want to learn about a political candidate or perhaps find out about a community board meeting, how are they getting that information? Well, they're getting it, of course, online. But new media clearly does not stop there. With new media, information has literally become an entry point to entire communities with their own set of rules and values and affiliations. And when considering civic engagement and technology, tapping into these networks is only one part of the equation. There are obviously so many more aspects to be explored, and that's exactly what we're going to do this afternoon. So it's my great pleasure to introduce our panelists, and let me first of all start with Jake Dobkin, who is a publisher and founder of The Gothamist, which is a network of local blogs, and I promise we're not going to ask him what a blog is, but it's a network of local blogs that focus on news, events, food, culture, and other local coverage. And in 2007, Gothamist was named Blog of the Year by Wired Magazine and given a Wired Rave Award. Our next panelist is Laura Ferlano, who is a writer, a researcher, a consultant, and a postdoctoral associate at Cornell in the Department of Communications Interaction Design Lab. Our next panelist is Lockhart Steele, who is the president and publisher of blog network Curbed, which includes Curbed.com, Eater.com, Rack.com, and Gridskipper.com. And last but not least, of course, is a dear friend of mine, council member Gail Brewer, who has been representing the Upper West Side of Manhattan and Clinton since 2002. She is the current chair of the Governmental Operations Committee, and she's focused on New York City's governmental structure and organization. So welcome to the panelists. So I want to start off with asking each of our panelists to give a brief five-minute overview of the work that they've done specifically in new media. So Jake, let me start with you. Uh, how many people here have read Gothamist? Because I, so, so some of you. Uh, so I started Gothamist uh, in 2002 uh, with my partner, Jen Chung, who runs the editorial side. I run the business side. Uh, for a couple of years, we did it just as a hobby. I was, at the time, in business school at NYU. And when I came out, I decided I would try to make a stab at running it as a business. And that's what I've been doing for the last five years. Uh, so in 2005, we had zero employees, and now we're up to about, now we're up to about 20. So uh, our flagship is Gothamist here in, here in New York City. Uh, we, in New York, we do about 10 million page views a month uh, on about a million unique visitors. And New York is about a third of our traffic. So uh, you know, now, after five years of doing it seriously, we've sort of gained you know, something of a real audience. And uh, I think that some of the ways we cover what goes on here in New York is going to be the way that mainstream media will be forced to start covering New York once they are uh, reduced to our level of resources. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Gothamist has six full-time editors in New York, you know, compared to the New York Times metro section, which I think has about 100 staff members. So. With the six people that we have here in the city, I think we do a really good job of covering what's most interesting every day in New York. Uh, you know, every day we have to start fresh, just like a newspaper, and we crank out, you know, 40 or 50 stories. And our goal each day is to tell a story about what, what's the most interesting stuff going on in New York. And, you know, we start every morning with news, and toward the afternoon we work into the lighter stuff, like arts and events and food. Uh, but whatever the big story is that day, you know, we'll be all over it, even, you know, if it's sort of outside those, those main areas. Uh, we'll, we'll cover national stories if, you know, something seems kind of relevant to the New York audience. Uh, and that kind of opportunism, I think, keeps the site really interesting and fresh. Uh, 
There's nothing interesting, I think, that happened in New York today that won't be covered somewhere on our site. Uh, and we, we also cover it in a voice that I think is different than the newspapers. We don't, you know, we, we don't stick to that sort of, you know, straight, fake, you know, uh, voice of reason. <laughs> you know, like, we try to tell the story honestly, like uh, we would tell it to one of our friends. And I think that that gives the site real personality. Uh, you know, we try to be funny when we can, serious when it's called for. Uh, and that, I think altogether, it, it's kind of interesting. I think where it's interesting to urban planning and you guys is that on our site, there's a real sort of community of interaction between us and those million readers. Our readers are largely, they're younger people, you know, between 20 and 40. And they're really interested in what goes on in the city. And I think, you know, I'm always surprised at the level of intelligence they show on civic affairs. Uh, and they're very strongly opinionated, even on issues that seem fairly minor. Like, today we had, like, a, a story about a bike lane protest on Prospect Park West. They laid down one of the new bike lanes. And uh, some older people, some senior citizens, are opposing it. They want it removed because it makes it harder to cross the street, or so they say, and it removed a few parking spaces from Prospect Park West. And so they staged a protest, and there was, today was a counter-protest by the people who liked the bike lane. And this story, you know, which is just like a normal bike lane neighborhood story, is dozens and dozens of extremely detailed comments where people are discussing, you know, how many bike, you know, how many spaces the bike lanes removed and how many were added by removing the bus stops. and. Uh, I think that that's really interesting. We kind of create a nexus for people who are interested in what's going on in the city. And I think that in, in that way, we sort of move the issues forward and, and, you know, bring people into the conversation. So that's the kind of stuff I'm interested in. Okay, great. Laura. Okay, um, I do have a couple slides, so I want to start with that. Um, so I'm a social scientist and I study mobile and wireless technology and in particular I've been interested in new organizational forms that result from our ongoing engagement with technology and if we think about the first, um, the first two decades or so of the internet and our usage of it, it's been a lot about expanding our networks, um, okay, <laughs> no. All right. It's been, it's been about expanding our networks globally and internationally, and I think that um, with the uh, greater understanding of mobile and wireless technologies, we're starting to see a lot more of the hyper-local and the face-to-face -face, um, ways in which we can draw on new media, and I think that's what's really important for cities and citizen engagement. So I'm going to start off with a video. Um, this is a, a group of... Um, researchers from City Lab. This is a project that I was involved in last year called Breakout, Escape from the Office, and it was funded by the Architecture League of New York as part of a sentient cities exhibit. Our partners in Barcelona actually staged a mobile work event on the tram, and so I'm gonna show you a video of that now. Okay, so you get the idea, so we can end the video. Um, and what's so interesting about this is that actually they were working closely with the tram company, and the tram company had identified a problem of graffiti on one end of the tram line, and they were very concerned about you know, youth who were getting involved, you know, up to no good and kind of getting involved in, in uh, 
denigrating the spaces of the tram. And instead, what they did, um, what was so exciting about it, is that they, they actually started a conversation with the tram company about the ways in which trams could become new spaces for interaction with citizens. And that thinking about perhaps interactive interfaces that could be built into the tram as ways of engaging um, youth. And of course, the tram company and I think the local government thought it would be really exciting to maybe have political discussions in the tram. And um, you know that uh, may or may not be able to engage youth. So talking about you know, video games or, or other interfaces that might get stu students or, or young people um, interested in civic ideas, but maybe through games or other uh, ways of interacting and, and to build that into transportation. Um, so that's the idea there. Um, so I'm going to show you, this is just a typical splash page that you see on any Wi-Fi network. Um, you probably have had the experience of joining a Wi-Fi network where you need to log in. And on the, on the side, you can see the list of the names of people that are logged in in that uh, physical location. And what's so interesting about this is that this is a splash page from the Newark City, a co-working community, uh, and their uh, Wi-Fi splash page. But I think these interfaces also provide ample uh, space and opportunity to start conversations that are more hyper-local. And I know, for example, that uh, Lincoln Center has long been interested in the possibility of uh, providing content over their Wi-Fi network and engaging passers-by on the street um, and getting uh, younger people in different audiences who maybe can't, are not interested in paying $100 to see the opera to still be able to, to access that content. So I want to think a little bit about these Wi-Fi uh, splash pages as uh, new venues for content to communicate with citizens. Um, and here's an example of the, the breakout communication platform that we created for the project. And th basically what this is, allows you to do is um, stage ad hoc local events in which everyone who's participating can stream their Twitter feed to the same page. And that allows for an ongoing documentation of an event. We were using it for a set of mobile work events that we did, but you could see how um, by integrating Twitter with this interface, um, you can provide documentation of, of events, whether they be protests or art exhibitions that are going on, and, and be able to see that all in one space as well. Um, finally, I just want to show a couple of examples and of kind of urban arch architecture and interfaces. And this is the Blinken Lights project in Berlin, uh, designed by the Chaos Computer Club um, in 2004. Uh, or going back even earlier than that. So that's a very interesting and simple technology. I mean, they use computers to control the lights on the um, old uh, East German education building and created ways of uh, having uh, citizens interact with it through games, able to send text messages to their friends and see them uh, large on the, the building. Um, and similar examples, this is another project called Ma Magical Mirrors in the SAP building in Berlin where people could walk up and interact with the building's interface. Um, and here's the uh, Madrid uh, Fashion Week, so another instance of you know, urban screens being used to communicate. And I think we could think more about making uh, these kinds of events more interactive and um, more interesting in terms of the artistic um, or civic content that could be provided. Um, and finally, I just wanted to show an example of Ground Crew, which is a mobile application, and this can be used to coordinate local action. So for example, if there's a neighborhood where you need to coordinate trash being picked up or dogs being walked or maybe babysitting services, this is a kind of mobile application that would allow you to coordinate those activities um, using mobile devices. And so that's, that's all I have for you today. Great, Nora, thank you. Lockhart. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so hey, I'm Lockhart. I'm the founder of Curb.com. Curbed is, uh, at least as it's described in the title on our site, a neighborhoods and weblog real estate, uh, or, or a weblog, a neighborhood and, web, and real estate weblog, that's what I'm trying to say. So in a lot of ways, Jake and I are, uh, are fierce competitors and uh, kind of do the same thing, which is publishing information for New York every day. Um, but what Curb does is a little more focused. Um, in the sense that Curb's fascination springs from a fascination, um, I think, with the fabric of New York's neighborhoods. Um, I started the Sykes. I lived down on the Lower East Side, down on Rivington Street. And I was living there about a decade ago, and the neighborhood was undergoing the sort of change that neighborhoods in New York undergo from time to time when the stars align and the hip restaurateurs start moving in and the crowds suddenly descend. And I found I had a, I had a personal weblog at the time and found myself writing a lot about the changes to the urban fabric of the Lower East Side. And, you know, frankly thought it would be a topic that would be of interest to a handful of people and was surprised when 
a personal site that I really started as a hobby grew to an audience of a few thousand people, including some of my neighbors who found the site and stumbled across it. And I realized that there was more of an appetite um, for discussion of these topics, which are broadly fascinating to people in this room. But I was surprised to find when I launched Curbed in 2004, how much interest sort of the average New Yorker takes in the built environment of this city. Um, and I think one of the things that the site's been able to do, and it's not just Curbed, I mean, sites like Curbed and Gothamist, in a lot of ways serve as part of an ecosystem online. Um, we're linking to each other's stories all day long. We certainly share some audience. Um, audiences may come to our sites for slightly different reasons, but ultimately what we're trying to do is empower people with information about what's going on around them. Um, and I won't go into the whole, a lot of what Jake said about how he runs his business is similar to mine, so you know, I'll do whatever he said, you can just apply to me. Um, but you know, I think one of the things that we deal with a little bit that's potentially interesting to the topic of this forum is just the question of to what end is it our job to drive civic engagement on sites like ours? And you know, one of the places we hear it a lot, and I hear it over and over again, is um, you know, Curb's job is to be entertaining at some level. We want people to get interested in these topics. And what that means is that language is too academic or too trade-oriented. You know, we try to avoid. We want, and we, frankly, we'd like to be funny a lot of the time. We want our audience to laugh. Um, so we love finding people who stand out for being absurd. And that can be on sort of the developer side of the equation, and it can also be on sort of the activist preservationist side of the equation. And I hear, especially from preservationists who uh, will email me or talk to me, you know, really angry at times about the fact that Curbed is not getting editorially behind, a, you know, to helping them save this particular building or helping them, you know, with this particular cause. Um, you know, on the other hand, I hear from um, developers as well who accuse us of being in the back pocket of preservationists. So, um, you know, I think Curbed is, in, and the blogs in general are doing a pretty good job of getting a lot of information out there for people. And it's not our job, I don't think, to drive that to drive that engagement any more directly than simply giving people the information to get involved in the kind of conversations that Jake was just talking about with the bike lanes. But certainly the tools are evolving and we see the conversations spreading now onto social media platforms as well. And you know, it's a topic that I know we're thinking about a lot and I'm, I'm sure we'll talk more about. Absolutely, thank you. And Gail. Um, thank you, Julian. I want to thank Denise McDermott and MAS for putting this together. And I'm kind of like old media and new media. I, you've have, got, you've got an iPad right here. I have an iPad and paper, so it's kind of a mess. <laughs> Um, this is really great panel. I will try to talk a little bit about what the city's doing and then um, integrate it into new media. The uh, city council has, as you know, 51 members and the technology committee was started, I don't know, probably Y2K time. And then when I came in in 2002 with a long history of interest in technology because I believe that government information should be public, which is almost an oxymoron. But the fact of the matter is we had a technology committee which I chaired um, and I'm still on for eight years. And the topics, even as recently as last week, my friend Dan Grodnick, a colleague, is now chair of it. Everything from what are the mobile devices that city agencies do or do not use to what is the franchise agreement that comes up for cable or Verizon doing to help the public. Um, what is the way in which we are communicated with. Julie started something called Notify NYC so the public can hear about emergencies or near emergencies in the city of New York. Um, what should the community board's role be in the city of New York? Um, certainly there are 59 of them. Some of you may be members, some of us have been members. Julie is a chair. The community boards in some cases are sophisticated in terms of communication with the constituents and with their own members, sometimes not. Um, some boards now have begun to use Twitter and uh, face page in order to communicate and to associate and coordinate with their web page. But let me tell you, that was not true. Even the web page some three or four years ago with a lot of community boards. The government is um, also, in terms of some of our hearings, we've had a lot of hearings on broadband. We went to all five boroughs, even we heard earlier uh, two of our panelists mentioned that they used to explain to people what a blog is. Well, we used to explain what broadband is. And the issue is that even though we have a lot of connectivity possibilities in the city of New York, you should know that if you're in a low-income area, 
It might be able to be connected, but the, given the cost of connectivity, it is not possible. So you will hear over and over again, I go to the library with all my kids to do the homework because I cannot afford at home. And I can go on and on about the need to have connectivity affordable, wireless.